Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, it is Lorena Peret at ITICA, the manager for climate change. And before I will hand over to Xavier, who is going to introduce our webinar and speaker today, I just quickly want to run through some technical logistics. So everyone is currently on mute. Uh, we will unmute you during our Q&A session, but however, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to enter them into the dialog box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. The webinar will run in one hour. It should be around 30 to 40 minutes presentation followed by the Q&A session. And we will be recording the webinar and posting on the Epica website after the event. And now I'm going to hand over to Xavier from CEL, who is the chair of the Climate Change Working Group, and who is going to begin the webinar, and then we'll introduce uh, you, the speaker. So over to you, Xavier. Thanks, Lorena. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining the, the, the APICA webinar on carbon capture and storage, a key technology in low emissions pathways. As Lorena said, my name is uh, Xavier Riera Palu, and I am the current chair of the Climate Change Working Group. The structure of today's webinar will be as follows. Uh, I will give a very brief introduction to IPICA, then a very, very quick outline of CCS technology and describe the IPICA membership collective views on CCS. And then I'll hand over to our keynote speaker, Dr. Julio Friedman from Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, to give us the, the, the bulk of the presentation. I hope there will be ample time for questions at the end. And as Lorena said, you will be unmuted uh, and, and, and you can ask questions. Uh, please uh, say your name and your affiliation when, when you ask the question, that'd be very helpful. So without further ado, so who is IPICA? IPICA is the, the, the Global Oil and Gas Industry Association for Environmental and Social Issues. Its mission is to enable the industry to improve its environmental and social performance. And it represents the consensus view of all our members. And it is the principal communication channel to the United Nations. So having introduced IPICA, I will now describe very, very briefly what carbon capture and storage consists of. With CCS, with carbon capture and storage, the CO2 emitted from a facility, say, for example, a, a refinery or a, or a power station, instead of being emitted to the atmosphere, it's captured, processed, and compressed to a liquid-like phase, what we call supercritical CO2, and it's then transported to the capture site. For example, an offshore facility that was once used for oil and gas production. It is then injected at high pressure, hundreds of meters below the seabed, into a, a storage site. The storage site can be a depleted field, but it can also be a saline aquifer, saline water aquifer, uh, which can be used to store CO2 permanently. There are currently 15 CCS projects in operation, 11 of which being related to oil and gas, with another seven, seven under construction and 10 more in advanced stages of planning. However, this is nowhere near the levels of deployment that are required to keep temperature rise in line with a two degree trajectory. At IPICA, we believe that carbon capture and storage will be a key technology for transformation of the energy system. It is already proven at scale, and CCS comprises a number of technologies that are widely used in the oil and gas industry and are readily available from a range of suppliers, companies, and service providers. The key issue is largely economic. 
rather than technical. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in its fifth assessment report, gives considerable importance to CCS deployment. The costs of delivering CO2 stabilization pathways without CCS are shown to be much higher, according to the, the IPCC report, about two and a half times higher than a base case with all technologies available. So in short, CCS is a key technology for delivering significant emissions reduction during this century. Without it, deep cuts in emissions are likely to be more costly and at worst, unachievable. Large-scale CCS is a reality today. However, for effective CCS deployment, there are a number of barriers that need to overcome. Most not notably, costs, value chain integration issues, CCS storage practices and standards, regulatory and legal uncertainties, including the treatment of long-term liabilities, permitting requirements, and public acceptance. IPICA believes that the barriers to widespread CCS development, deployment can be overcome. Indeed, the oil and gas industry is continuing to develop CCS technologies and projects, as well as addressing barriers and explore opportunities to enable its uptake. If I can summarize in a few words, IPICA welcomes the, the, the Paris Agreement and believes that the transition to a low greenhouse gas world is challenging but possible. We believe that the pathways to a low emissions future will require energy efficiency, electrification of new sectors, and alternative energy solutions, such as hydrogen or biofuels. CCS offers solutions across many sectors, and it's almost uniquely the technology that offers the opportunity for negative emissions. Collaboration will be essential, and along with effective policies and massive shifts in financial flows. The oil and gas industry is ready to play its role through the deep skills and resources it has in energy systems. And now I will hand over to our keynote speaker, as I said, Dr. Julia Friedman, until early this year, Dr. Friedman served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy for the Department of Energy. Dr. Friedman was on an assignment in Washington, D.C. from the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and he returned to Livermore in March. And there he serves as the Senior Advisor for Energy Innovation. Recently, he was honored with the Green Man Awards by the Greenhouse Gas Control Technologies Conference Series for his tireless efforts to promote carbon capture and storage, particularly at large, large scale. This award is given to those who have made career scale impact on the management of CO2 removal, storage, and utilization. Dr. Friedman earned a bachelor and a master's degree in geoscience from MIT and his PhD from the University of Southern California. After graduation, he worked for five years as a senior research scientist in the oil industry. So, Dr. Friedman, the floor is yours. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Javier. Uh, everybody hopefully can hear me. Uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to speak to you today. I've been a big fan of IPICA for many years and glad to have the chance to uh, uh, present and to answer some of your questions. Let me start with uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, for those of you who have been paying attention, uh, this very significant event happened last year about this time. It was signed in April at the UN by 197 parties, uh, including 191 countries. It is now actually ratified by 114 countries represent over oh, roughly 80% of the emissions. The slide is already old. There's been more members who've come on just in the past few days. Um, it's important to note as well that in the Paris Agreement, <clears throat> countries can determine their own uh, contributions, and in that, 10 countries explicitly include CC, 
uh, S and carbon capture and utilization as part of their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions. And even uh, a number of countries that don't explicitly include it, for example, the U.S. or China, have made clear that they do plan to include CCS as part of what they do. Uh, in part, what also came out of Paris was something that Javier related to, um, that negative emissions is becoming a trending topic, and the reason why is because uh, they had uh, identified a target of well below two degrees Celsius, a one and a half degree target is commonly how this is referred to. Many, since uh, it is almost impossible to reach that target, many believe that negative emissions are required to reach that target, which has raised the profile of CCS uh, within that context. I have to underscore how important the Paris Agreement is in that regard. Uh, one of the things it means is there's no shelter. Uh, most major economies, most global trade, most of the OECD and major non-OECD countries have already ratified and embraced Paris. So there's no way that you can sort of sidestep carbon constraints in your business. Uh, it's a very much a reality, not surprisingly, uh, all 100 of the Fortune 100 CEOs believe that climate is something that their company has to manage in their own long-term planning. Another thing about Paris is that uh, this is nationally self-determined. That politicizes the commitment within each country. Every country walking into Paris said, this is what we can and should do. Well, excellent. Then now they're on the hook for doing what it is they said they can and should do. Many heads of state campaigned on the Paris Agreement. And so uh, they feel like they are vested in the outcome, which means commitments will continue to be made, money will continue to be spent, and laws will continue to be passed. Uh, finally, within the Paris Agreement, a number of specific sectors are called out, and so industrial policies being set on the back of Paris worldwide, which affects things like trade of steel and cement <clears throat> and other energy-intensive commodities. Um, not surprisingly, many companies see opportunities in this space and are planning accordingly. To underscore what Javier said before, uh, it has been uh, stated repeatedly for many, many years uh, that CCS uh, and carbon capture and utilization are essential to hit our deep decarbonization targets. This here is for a two degree target, a 450 parts per million stabilization. This is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but there are a dozen studies that have the similar results. Essentially, if you don't have CCS, your chance of hitting that target is less than 50%. So like Javier, like Javier said, uh, in the worst case, you don't meet your target. In the best case, it, again, it's a 140% cost increase, so it uh, is a, roughly a two and a half times increase to hit the same target. Uh, if you embrace climate science, embrace climate math, and climate math is telling us that CCS is required. If you want to hit a one and a half degree stabilization, that means you need to stabilize at about 410. So we've got six years to hit that stabilization target. And again, if we don't have CCS, we're simply not going to hit it. One of the implications of this uh, is reverberating within the financial sector today. The least elegant way of expressing this is to keep it in the ground discussion that you've heard a number of environmental groups embrace. Envi keep it in the ground uh, is unlikely to really take place. What is more a concern is something that Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, has laid out, which is uh, his concern is that if we are in a carbon-constrained world, we know what the carbon budget is, we know how much we are allowed to emit within a certain time frame, if that estimate is even remotely correct, it's going to leave a number of these large assets stranded, oil, gas, and coal reserves. Um, and he said, it's important to note this, that they're unburnable without CCS. So if you had CCS, they would be burnable. He also says it alters the fossil fuel economics, which is also real. What he's most concerned about here, to be clear, is the fact that the financial institutions around the world are vested in these assets. Pension funds, sovereign wealth funds have a huge stake in these assets. And if, in fact, the assets are overvalued, there are going to be financial repercussions that will reverberate politically and in the lives of many, many people around the world. That's what they mean by the carbon bubble. Uh, it's a concern that 
carbon intensive natural resources are overvalued today. And if that's true, then as they become devalued, there will be financial consequences. Uh, already this is hitting the market in ways that people didn't quite expect. There have been shareholder motions at a number of companies, including a number of IPICA's members. Uh, most recently, Exxon, 38% of the shareholders, and at Chevron, 41% of the shareholders voted for the board to reveal what their climate plans are. Uh, very few banks or firms anywhere in the world will invest in new coal projects. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, the market capitalization of, of the U.S. coal companies has decreased 98% in the past three years. It's actually quite difficult. Uh, many companies have become more proactive in terms of managing the carbon bubble in CCS. It's worth specifically pointing out the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. Uh, on November 4th, the day that uh, the Paris Agreement came into force, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative announced a billion-dollar fund, $100 million a year for 10 years, in which 50% of that funds will go to CCS and 50% of those funds will go to uh, methane mitigation options. Uh, it's also important to note that CCS is explicitly and increasingly part of the strategy of many companies. Uh, in particular, ExxonMobil has made a partnership with Fuel Cell Energy, and they uh, are working up a large demonstration project in Alabama in real time. Uh, BHP, Billiton, Peabody uh, are vested in CCS projects. There's a number of corporate uh, entities like Suncor, which have set emission reduction targets in which CCS plays prominently. And there's been merger and acquisition activity by companies like Shell and Aramco and Husky to build, to buy and acquire companies that have know-how and expertise in CCS. So uh, this is something that uh, we will see more of as time goes forward as Companies that have long-term planning build the carbon bubble concerns in CCS into their long-term plans. Oh, sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button there. Thankfully, we actually know a lot about this. Uh, as Javier said, uh, there are already 15 projects online around the world and seven being built. Uh, these range from the Sleipner project, which has been operating for uh, over 20 years now and has put 20 million tons of carbon dioxide into a saline formation. Uh, the Quest project in Canada, which came online last year and is, has done that uh, for a couple of years and has already put uh, a million tons of carbon dioxide underground. Uh, the Boundary Dam project in Canada is the first retrofit of a existing coal plant with CCS. It's already put uh, uh, over a million tons underground uh, and is on track for 1.1 million tons a year indefinitely. There are projects in the Middle East. Uh, uh, a steel project, Emirates Steel uh, uh, Al Riata project came online last year, uh, sorry, just this month. Uh, Uthmania has been operating for about a year. That's a refinery project in Saudi Arabia. Archer Daniels Midland is an ethanol project. This isn't about fossil fuels, it's about emissions. And so the emissions from this ethanol plant in the United States are being captured and stored underground. Uh, and Gorgon, the biggest project in the world, is coming online very soon in Australia. And uh, even China has gotten into the act. Uh, their coal to methanol project uh, in, by Yangchang Petroleum uh, will be capturing a million tons of CO2 and putting that underground as well. So there's plenty going on. Um, and, and that's uh, just some of what's happening around the world. I'm going to keep pressing the wrong button here. Let me show you a couple of pictures. Uh, this is the Boundary Dam project, which I mentioned. It's been operating now for over two years. The steam coming out the top means it's working. Uh, this is a zero emission hydrogen project in Port Arthur, Texas. This is at a refinery run by Air Products. So again, not chumps. Uh, they have basically taken the CO2 byproduct stream from the steam uh, methane reforming unit captured it, compressed it, stored it underground. This makes the cheapest carbon-free hydrogen in the world. Uh, it's a buck 80 a gigajoule, and more than 3 million tons of CO2 have been stored at this site. Uh, this project is about to come online. This is the big brother of Petronova, I mean of uh, Boundary Dam. This is the Petronova project in West Parish, Texas. 
Um, this broke ground in September uh, two years ago. It's on time and on budget. It'll turn on this year. The all-in costs are $100 a ton. It's important to underscore that because a lot of people say, someday we'll get to $100 a ton. No, we're already at $100 a ton. And that's the all-in cost that includes capture, compression, transportation, and storage. And the people who run this plant and Boundary Dam and Air Products and all these other projects have basically said the second plant they can do for 20 to 30% less. So we're already below $100 a ton in terms of abatement. That's an important fact. I'll come back to that in just a moment in terms of other technologies. This is the Quest project. This is uh, the Scottsford Upgrader in Alberta. And again, they've been capturing the CO2 from this. It's fully operational as of a year ago and has stored over a million tons of CO2 into a deep saline formation. It's worth knowing that Shell triple sized the pipeline for this project. This project is a million tons a year, but the pipeline can handle 3 million tons a year. They expect to be able to have a business in which they actually uh, can gather CO2 from the other refiners and the other upgraders and provide that service to them. I'd mentioned these industrial projects in the Middle East. Uh, these have been operational for a while now, uh, again, in the million tons a year ballpark. Uh, they're using the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery in Saudi Arabia and uh, the United Arab Emirates, they think this is important for their economy. It is worth knowing though both countries insist that this is not tertiary recovery, that they don't need the CO2 to get more oil. They're happy to get the more oil. But what this is about is decarbonizing their production. They want low carbon supplies. It's a long-term strategy for them to manage their emissions. I will say we've already gotten a question on negative emissions. I'll come back to that later. Uh, this uh, is an interesting project in Texas. This is a utilization project, the Skyonic project. They're actually capturing CO2 from a cement plant and converting it into baking soda. The inputs to this plant are CO2 and salt, and what they get out of it is hydrochloric acid and baking soda. So they have two different products with two different revenue streams which they ship. They are capturing a fairly modest amount right now, 83,000 tons a year. They're avoiding, though, something more like 270,000 tons a year because what they're offsetting uh, is hydrochloric acid that's made by a very energy-intensive and carbon-intensive chloralkali process. So they are actually getting more carbon abatement than they are just by the CO2 capture at that site. Either way, I think this is uh, important, and increasingly, Carbon utilization is an important topic that people are interested in. I will also speak about that in a little bit. Oops, bam. Let me talk about the global context for CCS and a couple of trends that are likely to continue. One of them is, as I said before, the costs have dropped already significantly. I'm gonna spell that out in a moment. Then they will continue to drop because as we get more deployment, the cost will go down. Uh, as uh, Javier said, this is, means that policy is the issue, not technology. So technology, yeah, we can make it cheaper, yeah, we can make it better, but the challenge with CCS today is we don't have a market in which CCS is supported. And absent that market, there's limited opportunities for deployment. Uh, this takes us into the next thing, which is there's probably gonna be more carbon constraints. Uh, because of Paris, because of the increased need and urgency for CCS, we're gonna see more. That will probably start focusing increasingly on industrial sources, uh, in part because there's lots of options for technologies in the power sector, there's not so many options in the industrial sector. Uh, also what this means is that the innovation agenda, if we're gonna work on technology, really needs to be targeted. I'm gonna talk a bit about carbon capture and storage on natural gas. Uh, this will increasingly be a priority in something where IPICA has a particular stake. There will be greater focus on CO2 utilization, which we call CO2U these days. We need low capital approaches. Part of the challenge for CCS is that it takes a lot of money to build a project. As long as that's the case, the innovation will be slow and deployment will be slow. So we need to find ways to get stuff out the door that are modular with smaller individual incremental capital costs. One of the challenges this means is that the infrastructure for that has to be supported separately as opposed to on the back of the individual projects, that's also a policy, uh, a policy question. As I said before, we're gonna talk a bit about negative emissions too. We really need to start on that arena. Uh, and there's two different negative emissions pathways that include CCS, bioenergy with CCS or BACS, and direct air capture with CCS. 
uh, as DAX. Um, many people tell me today that carbon capture and storage costs too much. I say, no, it doesn't. If you look at carbon capture and storage today in terms of real costs, uh, they are comparable with many other clean energy technologies. This is from the World Resource Institute. Uh, and the circles that I've added there are for coal with CCS and gas with CCS. Uh, the dotted lines are for industrial CCS from a complicated source, like say a, a conventional steel plant or a cement plant. And the lower circle is for a pure source of CO2, say from an ethanol plant or a hydrogen plant. Uh, those costs are certainly within the range of many other clean energy technologies. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it is always cheaper than offshore wind, and it's generally cheaper than rooftop solar and community-based solar. So no, the costs are not too high compared to other clean energy technologies. This is another way of showing the same stuff. These are the unsubsidized costs for power, levelized cost of electricity, so just a couple of months ago were released by Lazard, and it gives you a sense of the range of where these are. The red bars are the ones that I've added for CCS on biomass, on coal, and on natural gas combined cycle. And these are using technologies today that you can buy off the shelf. There's a half dozen companies that will sell you a unit with a wrapper and a performance guarantee. And so we know what the price for these are, and we know what the cost for their operation are. Again, these are in range with many other technologies. They're in the range of uh, community rooftop solar. They're, in the, uh, they're less than offshore wind. They're less than utility solar thermal projects, like solar concentrating projects. And these are for retrofits. So we know that we can get this done. In some markets, some technologies may be cheaper, like utility scale PV or wind. Uh, in other markets, that won't be the case. And so CCS already has a place at the table in terms of clean energy technology, but from a policy perspective, there's still quite a lot lacking. In that consequence, the deployment of CCU and CCS technology is going to be heavily contingent on policy. Many groups have come out and said that they need policy parity, meaning you need something like the policies in place for solar and wind and, you know, low carbon fuels and so forth. You need something like that for CCS. Uh, I have to underscore that in my current role, I cannot support a specific policy arena or a specific policy pathway. I don't need to, thankfully. There's many, many policy pathways out there which could do the job. Uh, for example, uh, in the United States, one could extend tax credits for carbon capture storage the way that we have for wind and solar. Uh, in Europe, the feed-in tariffs that are available for renewables could be extended to include CCS or, for that matter, nuclear power and other things. The UK still have a mechanism for contract for differences. This has not really been supported for CCS, although the mechanism exists. Um, some countries provide direct grants. That's essentially what's happened in Canada and in the Middle East and in other countries. Um, China has announced state-sponsored strategic projects. That's another way to get these things built. Um, there's another policy framework by saying, well, instead of a renewable portfolio standard, an RPS, maybe we should have a clean energy portfolio standard, say, including other clean energy types like uh, nuclear and fuel cells and CCS. Instead of a renewable portfolio, a renewable fuel standard like we have in the United States, maybe we could have a low carbon fuel standard like we do in California. Expanding those incentives would get, would make a big difference in terms of getting the deployment for CCS. Uh, if you don't like incentives, if you like sticks instead of carrots, uh, disincentives also work. Norway is the global leader in technology and deployment. Not surprising, they have a carbon tax and have had for 25 years. That carbon tax is about $80 a ton, so it's quite steep and certainly enough to get the deployment. You can have regulatory caps. The Clean Power Plan uh, provides that kind of emissions cap in the United States. California has an emission standard of 1,100 pounds per megawatt hour. You just can't sell into California's market without it, so if you want to sell coal power, you got to do carbon capture with it. Uh, many countries are toying with the idea of carbon tariffs. That might be a way to incentivize industrial CCS. The challenge right now, politically speaking, is that there is no political penalty for rejecting CCS. Uh, if people say no, nothing happens. We witnessed that in the United Kingdom just last year uh, when uh, George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, canceled the CCS uh, million pounds uh, the project 
uh, and routed that money to other things. Uh, if we, in fact, need to change the policies, then uh, companies around the world need to actually lean into it and figure out how they want to engage with politicians to create policies that will serve this industry. Uh, importantly, many organizations already support this. Uh, I draw particular attention to the UN Economic Commission on Europe, UNECE. Uh, Christian Frisch Bach wrote uh, compellingly about three years ago that CCS was required to hit the target and that he thought CCS was clean energy. Since that time, the United Nations Framework Convention has explicitly endorsed CCS as clean energy technology and asked for increased policy support. By no means is that the only group. The International Energy Agency, the World Economic Forum, the World Energy Council, Carbon Capture, the Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, the World Coal Association, many, many groups around the world have come forward and said CCS uh, is required and needs policy support. Just in the United States, the Western Governors Association, Southern States Energy Board, Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, and many NGOs, Clean Air Task Force, uh, Great Plains Institute, Environmental Defense, National Resource Defense Council, and many others have come forward and said the same thing. And here's a picture of the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. Below, these are the CEOs of uh, eight of the 10 member companies who have all come out and said, we need more policy support to get this done. And the International Energy Agency has been very helpful in terms of pointing out what kinds of things governments can do. You can introduce financial support mechanisms. You can encourage policies to get the storage sites set up and well and help make the market that way. Uh, industrial development for hubs, transport infrastructure uh, is an important thing to do. Making sure that your laws and regulations align with CCS so that they can be ready to go. There's plenty to be done. Uh, and there's no shortage of ways to go about doing it. So at this point, it's helpful for people to think about how they want to roll up their sleeves and be proactive in this space and get the job done. In the United States, there's a number of policies and proposals out there. I'm going to only speak in depth about one of them, which is this 45Q tax credit reform. But there's a lot of legislation out there and that, that is draft legislation pending. And there's a number of other policies out there, including, interestingly, things like a CO2 utility. Uh, there's also things like changing the laws around master limited partnerships. Uh, there's so many different ways to think about going and supporting CCS. Uh, it's worth knowing that, that this has been tried. Uh, within the Obama administration, for example, we put forward uh, tax credit proposals in two budgets, in the 2016 and the 2017 budget, which basically created an investment tax credit and a sequestration tax credit, sort of like a production tax credit, uh, which would have been enough to close the gap for financial viability for projects. Uh, 45Q is the most uh, active of these policy efforts in the United States, and I'm just going to explain what is happening right now. In the House, you have a bill, and in the Senate, you have a bill. Uh, the numbers have gone up since I drafted this slide. There's now 50 sponsors in the House and 30 sponsors in the Senate. Uh, it includes a mixture of Republicans and Democrats, so it has bipartisan support as well as bicameral support. And the outlines of these bills look very similar. Basically, it says these are going to be permanent credits. Uh, in the House, you can claim them for 10 years, in the Senate for 12. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, any application, enhanced oil recovery, storage use, doesn't matter, uh, 30 bucks a ton in the House. Uh, in the Senate, it's 50 bucks a ton for storage, 35 bucks for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, fairly small eligibility requirements, 150,000 tons. So kind of smallish ethanol producers can get in the game, smallish gas uh, polishing units, smallish refineries. Uh, slightly smaller in the Senate, again, 100,000 tons a year. And uh, they're not fully refundable tax credits, but they're transferable, meaning anybody who's part of the project can take it. So. If you're a fairly small company, if you partner with a fairly large bank or a fairly large uh, uh, operator, then in fact they can use the tax credits. And so it's possible to transfer them and, and you don't have to have a big tax appetite yourself. If this gets passed into law, say in the lame duck or in the next Congress, this will dramatically change the landscape for CCS in the U.S. because it will create substantial incentives. And already there's a number of power projects and industrial projects which will activate once these are passed. One more bit on costs, and then I'm going to move quickly through the technology piece. Uh, 
many people underestimate the fact that wind and solar are very cheap right now. They really are. And if you look at it straight up, if you're saying I'm going to build a new project, wind and solar in many markets are quite cheap. And they're less than 40 bucks a ton CO2 in terms of real uh, comp comparison. It's important to know, though, that it depends a lot on what you're comparing with. Uh, part of the reason why this is the case is that when you start thinking about the intermittency, when you start to think about curtailment, when you start about thinking about the cost of adding batteries, the comparative cost for these technologies doesn't look so good. And in fact, often uh, wind to solar projects with batteries in a curtailed market are more like 100 to 400 bucks a ton. And what it really boils down to is how much curtailment there is. So let's say that you have 20% solar, you're going to have 50% curtailment. <laughs> That's a lot. And that curtailment really affects, in fact, uh, how, what the real cost of these technologies are. This is work that's been done by Jeff Brown at Stanford. Uh, he's wonderful. I encourage you to reach out uh, and, and talk about a number of these things with him. But uh, this is what the range of these things are. So if you're comparing a solar project in a good solar resource market with a new build natural gas combined cycle plant, yeah, in fact, new build solar project will be cost effective. That's true. But if you're talking about turning down an existing coal or gas asset, the costs really look very different. So uh, that's what uh, you're looking at here. If you're looking at retrofitting a uh, coal plant with 90% carbon capture, or if you're looking at a natural gas plant with 80% carbon capture, those are already going to be cost competitive with turning down a natural gas plant, and in many markets will be cost competitive with turning down an existing coal plant. If you're looking at these instead, though, with a situation where you've got substantial overgeneration or where you're adding batteries, again, CCS is already much more cost competitive than that. In fact, this situation gets worse if you start building more and more overcapacity because at that point, diminishing returns will be set into the renewable markets, and it will be harder and harder for new CCS projects to compete. And that means that they will be saddled with low capacity factors in the future. CCS plants in an overcapacity-driven market for renewables will be saddled with low operating rates, uh, and overbuilding just reinforces that. So I believe there's a real urgency to move around CCS and to get it into the market to avoid further disadvantaging the technology through market distortions. So let's look at what we see in terms of fossil energy demand around the world. For the next 30 years, basically, coal demand worldwide is going to be flat. It's going to decrease a bit in China. It's going to decrease in Europe and the United States. Uh, will increase in Europe, in India, and other countries around the world. It's basically going to be flat. In contrast, gas demand is going to grow substantially uh, in both OECD and non-OECD countries. Basically, it's going to double over the next 25 years. The punchline, there won't be any reduction in emissions. In fact, emissions are going to grow worldwide, this, given this trend. Um, it also means that the rate of growth is going to slow compared to what it might have been, but not even quickly enough to matter. From an emission standpoint, uh, this is actually very troubling, and it reinforces the need not only to do CCS on coal, but to do CCS on gas as well. And in fact, natural gas capture really is a priority. Thankfully, there's a number of technologies in place uh, to bring this to market soon that look very interesting. I'll draw your attention to ExxonMobil's deal with fuel cell energy. This is very interesting. Uh, they have realized that they can use a molten carbonate fuel cell, like the one pictured at the lower left, as an afterburner for a plant. So essentially, you can hook one of these things up to a natural gas plant. You can capture the CO2 coming out of the gas plant and run the flue gas through the molten carbonate fuel cell. That concentrates uh, and cleans the emission stream from the gas plant and puts the CO2 in a concentrated form. Exxon likes this because they can sell gas to both the gas plant and to the fuel cell. And what comes out the end is something that they uh, can then shepherd and manage in terms of CO2 management. Uh, there's an interesting technology from a company called NetPower. Uh, this is basically oxy-fired combustion in a natural gas turbine. Very, very difficult to do. Uh, but these, this is a real project. They have a $100 million turbine from Toshiba and $100 million of cash from Exelon. They're building this in Texas now. It should turn on sometime in March, and it should be fully operational by the summer. 
if it performs as ad advertised, this will be a net water positive, 100% captured natural gas system, and the delta on cost is between zero and 10% above that baseline. Uh, if that turns out to be true, then that means that net power is a destination. That means you can actually do natural gas power production with this turbine and know that your CO2 is pre-concentrated, pre-captured, and ready to be stored. I'd mentioned industrial CCS as a priority. Uh, based on what the International Energy Agency forecasts in terms of need, about half the projects worldwide will be power projects, the other half will be industrial projects. 70% of all the projects will be in non-OECD countries. So this is just what the work looks like. If we want to get the abatement that we need, this is how it's going to be deployed. Uh, importantly on this, uh, the politics in industrial CCS are much easier than in the power sector. Again, in part in the power sector, there's many regulatory frameworks, there's many technology options, people touch power every day in their lives, and so they feel very strongly about it. Not so much in steel making or in refining or in cement manufacturing, uh, which is actually where a lot of the emissions are. 21% of global emissions worldwide are in, heavy, are in the industrial sector, and uh, about 10% of emissions worldwide are in concentrated, pre-captured streams of CO2 uh, in the industrial sector. So the opportunity space there is quite large. Just looking at the United States, um, this is the distribution of high purity CO2 streams, so ones that are ready for storage today. Um, within 100 miles of a potential CO2 site, you've got 43 million tons a year that you could capture and store for less than $30 a ton. Again, going back to the 45Q tax credit, if that tax credit comes through, there's going to be a business around capturing and storing this. Um, the largest single source, just one source, is 4 million tons. You could get that, it'd be like pulling almost a million cars off the road. It's a hugely valuable undertaking. And in fact, there's already a certain amount of CO2 infrastructure to do the job. So this is fairly easy to activate in a lot of places. The entry cost is low and the opportunity is large. Ultimately though, we need many, many more projects if we're gonna get there. Uh, as I said, we need a factor of 100 more projects than we currently have uh, online. The uh, 22 projects uh, that are operating or under construction will represent 40 million tons a year we need 4 billion tons a year to hit a two degree target. And uh, we just simply need more projects, which means we need policy support for those projects. Let me talk a minute about CO2 utilization, CO2U. We need more of these options and we need better options. Many people will argue, and I think fairly, that this is probably a niche application. Yeah, maybe that's true. Uh, maybe worldwide we'll only get a few hundred million tons of this uh, through utilization. but. It creates revenues. Politically, it's a thing that people can embrace. It changes the nature of the conversation. There's no reason not to do it if you can. The technologies that we have are not great. Some of them are not crazy. Uh, turning CO2 into minerals, like uh, turning uh, silicate rocks into carbonate rocks is something we know how to do. Um, you can turn those minerals and then into building materials or use them in cements. That's not crazy. Um, thermodynamically, that is favored. Technically, it's very challenging. Economically, it's very challenging, but it's something we should do. Something that is also even harder than that, also not crazy because of the energy balances, polymerization, turning CO2 into plastics, or turning CO2 into algae, and then turning the algae into products. Again, the economics of this are very challenging. Today, if you wanted to turn CO2 to algae into biofuels, that's like $20 a gallon. That's quite pricey. Uh, but the engineering is, is doable. And if we, again, start the research, start deployment, the cost will come down and get in line. Um, if you want to turn CO2 into other things like fuels or chemicals, uh, you really need ultra low uh, cost, zero carbon power. Uh, we don't really have that yet. And if you had it, you'd want to use it up front. But again, we live in a world in which we have curtailed power markets. We live in a world in which we're building out uh, renewables at a high rate. Some of that can be harvested during down market opportunities, and CO2 can be turned into fuels through electricity, through biochemicals, through these other things. Um, this is something that politicians love, and this is something that companies love. I draw your attention here to this uh, integrated test center in Wyoming, 
This is the Dry Forks Power Plant in Gillette, and these people that are governors from a number of states and CEOs breaking ground on the test bed. This integrated test center is a place where people can test CO2 utilization uh, and hopefully get the cost down through increased testing and through the increased deployment. Uh, in the long term, 50 years, something like that, we know that we need to close the carbon cycle on fuels. A number of oil and gas companies, including members of IPCA, are putting real money into this now. It is not an easy thing to do. The main thing that you need is catalysts. There are electrical pathways, there are photonic pathways, there are thermal and chemical pathways to turn CO2 into fuels. In all cases, you need catalysts to make the energy penalties relatively small. Again, you know you're losing from a thermodynamic basis, so you're trying to minimize the thermodynamic loss for the catalyst. Okay, great. Um, we don't really have the catalyst we need, uh, and no commercially available project exists to do this. Again, that means the work's hard. That means there's ground for an R&D program. Today, there is no R&D program anywhere in the world which is sponsored nationally to do this. It's all one university here, one company there tackling this, uh, we simply need to do more, and we need to do more faster. Hi, Julius. To be sorry, relevant. For, sorry. Yes. Hi, Julius. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, since we would like to have some time for Q and A, please could you possibly wrap up in the next minute or so? Yes. Well, uh, as you know, I'm reaching the end of my presentation now. I've only got okay. a, a couple of more slides. Good. Um, Thank you. If these technologies are going to be relevant, uh, they need to be low capital. Um, there's many things that can drop the cost of capital for these things, using more plastic instead of using more steel, taking advantage of things like 3D printing and advanced manufacturing, uh, reducing the development time and costs by harnessing supercomputing, all these sorts of things. But fundamentally, uh, we are not uh, innovating quickly enough in this space. And for comparison, if you take a look at solar and wind, solar costs have dropped for real. Uh, 80% just in the past eight years. And they've done so because making one solar module is relatively easy. So the innovation rate is fairly quick. The capital entry barrier is low. Same thing with wind. It's easy to innovate around one windmill um, or to do sensors and controls around existing windmills. So the capacity factors have gone up and the cost for these technologies have gone down. The pace of innovation matters here. And if we're not innovating quickly in the carbon capture and storage space or in the CO2 use space, then we're gonna miss real opportunities. I'm gonna close here with a short discussion on negative emissions. Again, Paris has highlighted the fact that if we wanna hit a one and a half degree target, we just need to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it someplace. So technology development and demonstration is required. Now, we know that there's actually many things that can pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, and in fact, the Center for Carbon Removal has put a bunch of documents together that explain a bunch of this. There's two National Academies studies in the United States, one of which is focused completely on uh, carbon removal technology. Many of these, like bioenergy with CCS, or pulling CO2 out of the air and storing it underground, or turning it into long-lived carbon negative materials, uh, enhancing the weather, all of these things are actually technologies that involve carbon capture and storage. Uh, again, there isn't a national R&D program anywhere in the world. Uh, for those of you in the UK, uh, I think one has been announced like last week and might be happening, it's fairly small, but really uh, we need to step it up. If we know that this is part of what we need to do, if we know that to balance the atmosphere we need to pull CO2 out of it, uh, then we should harness the opportunities that CCS provides us to demonstrate that that's the case. Thankfully, there's groups out there already doing it, and this is where I'm gonna close. There's a project in Illinois, a biofuels project, which has already put a million tons underground uh, and is about to ramp up to triple their input to three million tons, a, I mean, to a million ton per year. There's also two companies, one in Vancouver, one in Switzerland, which are capturing and storing CO2, I'm sorry, which are capturing CO2 out of the air today at reasonable prices, at 200 to 250 bucks a ton. That is already in bounds for a number of commercial applications, like the beverage industry or food industry. And these are modules that ship. You can go out there and buy these things with a wrapper and a performance guarantee today and they'll ship you a unit. Um, is that cost competitive with a lot of other technologies today? Not at all, no. However, we still know we need that. So with that, uh, I'm 
glad for your time and attention and happy to take uh, a handful of your questions. Some of these are already online. Uh, Sandeep uh, asked a question about what I mean by negative emissions. Uh, hopefully that's uh, been explained now. Uh, when I talk about negative emissions, it's also synonymous with carbon removal, pulling CO2 out of the air. Um, and that is as an overt action. Um, uh, I, to Marco, uh, I am not meant, uh, I am, he says, says, as you mentioned, only out of Europe projects, uh, can you provide some information regarding the EU? Yes, yeah, so the EU has been having some trouble getting its act together here. Um, in terms of the, one of the things that is true uh, in terms of, say, red, that's relevant in terms of a negative emissions pathway, in terms of red, uh, which is uh, uh, about land use, uh, is a, includes uh, the opportunities for things like adding biochar to soils or reforesting lands that have been deforested. Uh, those are actually very helpful things to do and are important policies. Uh, in the context of CCS, um, many countries in Europe uh, have a political logjam with CCS. Germany, uh, notably, the uh, UK, notably. Um, in addition, although the European Commission has been saying for a while that CCS is important and has put forward uh, uh, programs like NER 300 and NER 400 uh, to, to finance these things, uh, it has not yet pulled together projects. It has not yet pulled together uh, frameworks which really activate the markets. And the European trading scheme is not trading at a high enough level to finance these projects. Um, it is possible that this will shift soon. The road project uh, in uh, Rotterdam, I think, is close to ignition. Uh, the Teesside project in the UK in a similar way. Um, Norway, of course, is not part of the EU European Union, but has certainly been doing projects there. And I think countries in Europe can learn from what Norway has done. Alyssa Cotton asks, given CCS has been demonstrated at scale in many sectors, but remains to be demonstrated on gas power, um, I think the way that this is going to happen is, first of all, uh, the net power project that I've talked about will go forward fairly soon. Um, I will tell you that within the U.S. government, we tried very hard to get its natural gas project on the books. Uh, Congress had language preventing us from doing that, which made it hard. Uh, that may change with the new Congress, we will see. In the meantime, I actually think uh, it is possible we will see CCS on gas in California because California has strong emission standards and financing opportunities through the Public Utilities Commission. It is also possible that we will see this uh, in the Middle East. Uh, already, a number of countries there have been doing front-end engineering design studies uh, on CO2 capture and with EOR. Uh, on retrofits of natural gas plants and even on desalination plants. Uh, perhaps ironically, it may be that the first natural gas with CCS projects uh, take place uh, in the Middle East, which for many years has been reluctant to talk about climate or take action on climate, but today is actually very forward-leaning and very proactive in that space. Um, uh, we got a question about providing a glossary of terms. Uh, I will work with the people from IPICA to do that. Uh, Alyssa asked about CO2 utilization. Um, it is the policy questions around CO2 utilization are still forming. Uh, in many politicians' minds, this is a brand new topic. They didn't know you could turn CO2 into stuff. Uh, knowing that that's an option for them is something that they are increasingly interested in. Uh, for example, uh, in the United States uh, Congress, recent appropriations language included a directive to the Office of Fossil Energy saying put $10 million a year into CO2 utilization. So good, that, that, that's something that we are happy to see. Um, it is important to be clear-eyed about the carbon cycle lifetimes about this. The life cycle analysis in CO2 utilization is very important. If you don't get that right, then you're just wasting a bunch of time and money. You really need to make sure that the CO2 is used in a way which it delivers relative uh, carbon reductions, and you have to do it in a way, if, if the stuff is going back into the atmosphere quickly, let's say turning CO2 into a fuel, then you need to be honest about the accounting of that 
and demonstrate that the CO2 is, uh, that you're, you're counting for that in a way which is robust and reproducible and acceptable. And for example, if you pull CO2 out of the air and then turn it into a fuel that is net carbon neutral, if you take CO2 out of a power plant and turn that into a fuel, you're displacing something in the market, but it's not necessarily reducing carbon. Thankfully, the International Energy Agency and a number of groups have been very, very good on the life cycle analyses, and that's actually uh, where the policy needs to go. As one example that people can point to, the uh, California Air Resources Board is updating their low carbon fuel standards. They are looking at opportunities for CO2 utilization and CCS as part of the low carbon fuel standard, and they're doing a lot of work on the life cycle analysis to ensure that the accounting is robust. Julio, we have uh, yes. about five minutes left, and I would like to see if there is any question on the phone. I think the, now, mm -hmm. the, the lines are now open, so if anyone has a burning question, please put it forward. We do have one other question. <laughs> we have a question from from Jeff Stiles, which I haven't answered yet. Uh, while people are formulating your questions, he okay. asked about the advantages of high concentration CO2 versus low concentration CO2. Um, obviously, if you have high concentration CO2, say from a coal plant at 14 percent, or from a cement plant at 33 percent, the overall cost for capturing on a dollar per ton basis is typically lower. Uh, air is very challenging because it's 300 parts per million or 400 parts per million, and so the partial pressure of CO2 is very low, and that makes the economics very hard. Um, one of the things that is a consequence of that is if you know you're going to capture from a source like air or a really low concentration stream, you actually start with different premises, different processes, different contactors, different technologies. That work has already led to breakthroughs in CCS generally. Um, Sandeep has asked another question about the aviation industry. He said, is one industry that has to capture its carbon for any growth in the future? Um, the aviation industry is interesting. Europe tried to put carbon tariffs into place around aviation. Uh, China came back strong and said, under no circumstances are you going to do such a thing, and that initiative died. Um, but, but the aviation industry knows that its carbon is very hard to manage. Um, they are not lobbying specifically for CCS, but I'll tell you right now, they are hungry for uh, negative carbon options. Uh, current technology guesses for how, what it would cost to decarbonize an airplane range from $3,000 to $10,000 a ton. It's just hard to do. You can't build electric planes and hydrogen planes, and you know it's just it's super super hard to do. And they don't really have low carbon fuel cost options. So if they could, if they had something, they'd love to have it. Um, uh, I think there's an opportunity in that from a technology perspective. Uh, I think the more powerful lobbying would actually come from heavy equipment manufacturers, from extractive industries like oil and gas companies and coal companies from heavy industry like refining and cement, if those companies came forward and said, we think it's important to bring forward policy support to CCS, it would dramatically change the conversation in many, many parts of the world. Last call for questions? We have time for one more question. Anyone on the phone? Okay, great. So. Unless that anyone has any more questions, I think I'm afraid that we are running, we are at the end of our webinar. So, uh, so if you have any further questions, please uh, you could send to the Secretariat by email and we can follow this discussion over email. And so, let me just again, thanks. Julio for a very, very interesting, engaging, and thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure there will be some, some uh, follow-up questions, which, as Lorena said, we will, we will action from our end. Yeah, Excellent. I just want to... Well, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's the same. I just want to raise a big thank you for both of you, Julio and Xavier, and thank you all of the people for joining the webinar today.
And yep, that's a reminder that the webinar will be posted on the APCA website.